Yeah, I have a channel. Don't worry about it. Sit so close so you can hear the other What can you find? Okay. Thank you guys for coming. I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, please take a second to turn off or silence your cell phone so we don't have any disruptions. Um, the main announcement is that installers have been here all week working on the new permanent exhibits and our reopening will be on Saturday, May 1st. So we'll be free to the public. We'll have live music, kids activities, refreshments. Um, so we're really excited to finally reopen after all this time and we hope to see you all there. As for upcoming programs, our May brown bag lunch will be, be will be with Sal Kumela, the preservation planner for the city of Fernandina Beach, who will discuss often overlooked historical elements of Fernandina's streetscape. And then for our May third on third, we'll have Frank Ofelt discuss his newest book entitled Fort Clinch, Fernandina, and the Civil War. So that's a little preview of upcoming events, but tonight we have Al for Twos. Al for Twos attended the University of Miami, where he received a master's degree in engineering. He served for four years in the United States Air Force and then began his professional career in the healthcare industry. Retiring in 2010, he relocated to Fernandina Beach. Al joined Nassau Habitat for Humanity in 2011 and was on the board by the end of 2013. He is currently the board president. So everyone, please welcome Al Patu. Thank you, everybody, and I uh, appreciate uh, you coming out and being here in person. But obviously, also the people who are seeing this virtually, I'm sure that uh, um, you'll find the information uh, that I'm going to convey to you uh, to be really interesting. And hopefully you'll learn things that you weren't aware of before um, attending this presentation. So maybe before I get started, one of the things that I'd like to do and ask anybody here or anybody who wants to um, make a comment uh, through the website, when you hear the term affordable housing, what, what is your frame of reference? What, what comes to mind? What are the elements that you think about when you hear the term affordable housing? Well, for me, it's probably um, uh, council houses, as we call them, in England, where there were vast sort of um, areas where all the streets had council houses um, that you, you rented back from the council. So rental property mm -hmm. that is built by a governmental agency or a state agency. Yes, and people rent them at, a, at an advantageous price. So when you hear affordable housing, that's your frame of reference. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Any housing that is um, that permits the the people who live within it to live um, in whatever income um, bracket that. Uh, they have, and obviously, for affordable housing, normally we're talking about people with a very limited income. So that's a broader view. That view is basically suggesting that the income criteria is one of the reasons that the word affordable is the modifier, as opposed to luxury housing or other modifiers. Anybody else? I also think they're for for purchase, not to be bought and rented out over here, but therefore basically, you know, low income people who can't afford it and probably they get special loans and everything on the housing and everything. Okay. Just so they can have a house. I would guess most of them are you know, they have to meet all building standards. Oh yeah, definitely. So they're, you know, just homes targeted for specific audience, normally by cities or something like that or county or something like that I'll say. and they will hire volunteers if you can buy volunteers who will help construct the places in order to keep the cost down on the construction but interesting that one of your uh points of reference is that you indicated that these homes that are then made available to low-income people are often sponsored or built by by the communities themselves and 
And I, I think I think you've kind of confirmed what I suspected that there's a lot of um, issues that convey to different parts of the population what affordable housing means. And the reality from our success story, and, and we really, the current, the local habitat affiliate here on the island is extremely successful. And the things that have made us successful are that we have expanded the, um, the parameters to create a model that other habitat affiliates are also using, but that in reality is perhaps not well known because most of the population at large, when they hear the word habitat, often they remember Jimmy Carter and they remember that it's somewhere in Georgia and they may or may not remember that um, people volunteer and build houses, but beyond that, they've never had the need or the interest to understand the mechanics of how that comes together and the difference between habitat in Amicus, Georgia um, and the difference between an affiliate of Habitat sitting in Fernandina Beach or in Jack's Beach or in Marietta, Georgia. And there are hundreds of affiliates around the country. And the affiliates of Habitat is where the real community effort happens. So keep that in mind as we go through this because I think you'll find that your, your understanding of affordable housing especially as Habitat has interpreted it, will broaden your point of view. And maybe you can help us broaden and educate other people that you communicate with about this, this expanded point of view. OK, so that's kind of an, a quick introduction. Um, and so today, I want to give you some information about NASA Habitat and what it's accomplished, but also talk about the success story. And I, the reason I, I want to harp on that a little bit is that I think there is often a simplification in people's minds about what it would take to create an affordable house or an affordable apartment or an affordable building. There's this kind of this concept that you go to a, you go to a developer, a for-profit developer, and you offer him a tax break, and you say, you know, if you build some housing that people with lower income can afford will give you a tax break. And that all of a sudden, affordable housing happens. There isn't, in our community, one single success story that has followed that model. Not one. There is not a single for-profit developer affordable housing that has been erected in the last 15, 20 years with that model in mind. So that suggests that it is not a viable model. And we have to understand why. Why is that model not viable? What are the reasons why that is has not worked in the past and may not work in the future? So I want you to understand the details of what makes our process work. What are the key elements and what are the examples that have allowed us to be successful? So Habitat here is incorporated as a Florida not-for-profit, and it's called Nassau Habitat for Humanity, Inc. Any city, town, unit, county that wants an, a, a habitat chapter has to create it from scratch. People in the community have to get together, and they have to incorporate, and they have to form a not-for-profit corporation, and they have to do all, put, up, put get a board together and become a community organization. Our community was very fortunate to have a couple of people, uh, Jesse Duke, who is a, a local a painter, and um, uh, a couple of other folks. Back in 1993, they said, guess what? We want to create a chapter of, of Habitat here. And they did all the work, heavy lifting work. And when you, when you get done, what you have is you have a local board and you have a local organization that can then use the Habitat name to be, start the process of developing affordable housing. Habitat at the, at the national level will assign the territory. We are responsible for housing in a certain area of Nassau County, and those are the areas in which we have to build. We can use their name 
if we follow certain regulations, we can apply for a not-for-profit status because of our affiliation with them. So, but it all happens only if it's locally initiated. So, if Callahan wants an affiliate chapter of NASA of Habitat for Humanity, they have to create it because our area of interest in terms of providing housing only extends as far as Highway 95 um, because. Habitat International is responsible for seeing that the different areas are not competing for resources. So Jack's Beach has their own habitat, the city of Jacksonville has their own habitat. We're the one here in Nassau. What do we do? Well, as you can imagine, we create safe, affordable housing, but it's a partnership. We partner with the individual that has applied for the house and that qualifies for the house and we provide certain things and they provide certain things. So they provide sweat equity um, and they help promote our product and they, in a sense, accept the responsibility of being a homeowner. And that speaks to the whole concept that in many people's minds, affordable housing is rental property. Our model is affordable housing is a home that you will buy and build equity with and you will own it for as long as you continue to pay the mortgage and as long as you own it and you're building equity you are a community resident who pays property taxes and who contributes to the community in terms of their personal labor and their personal effort so our model relies on the idea that we're creating a partnership with these families that now will be able to live in an area where their income may not have allowed them to do so without our help. And the other thing that's important is we're supported entirely by donations from local individuals, local corporations, local individuals, local businesses. There is no big granddaddy in the sky. We don't get money from Habitat International. In fact, we send them money. Uh, we don't get money from some grant unless it specifies that it's available for affordable housing and you meet those requirements. And we have found that meeting some of the requirements of some of the more elaborate granting agencies is very difficult for small entities like ours. There are some habitats that are very large. The habitat in Naples, Florida, the habitat in Jacksonville are large organizations with paid staff and pay people who write grants and paid executives and paid CEOs. And we've got 10 volunteers on a board and, um, and uh, that's it. And if we can't pull it off, it doesn't happen. So we don't have this big elaborate support structure that provides money. We have to raise every dollar that we use for our mission. And it has to come from the local community. Our homeowners live and work in the community. That's important. They are our neighbors. They are the secretary at the sheriff's office. They are the radiology tech at Baptist Hospital. They are the nurse's aide at a local clinic. They are the entry level elementary school teacher at the school. That's who they are. They are Habitat homeowners and they live in our community and they're our neighbors. That's, a, um, I guess, a, a distinction that often is lost when people at some sort of committee level, you know, talk about affordable housing. I don't know who they think is going to live in that housing, but I don't think that they believe it's the, uh, assist, the um, entry level teacher that's teaching their child in kindergarten. I don't know that they've made that connection. I don't know that they've connected that it's the radiology tech that took their x-ray when they went to the hospital. But it is, that's who they are. They're our neighbors, they live in our community and they, they work here. They cannot afford market level homes, which is what this gentleman said. So they become our client. They become the people that we look for to be able to help them. How do we define affordability? The, the definition we've chosen because Habitat suggested that we use it 
is that their income cannot be any more than 60% of the local median income. Arbitrary, maybe, but that's the metric we use. The local median income, give or take, is about $60,000. Local median income for this part of Nassau County. Therefore, 60% of that is $36,000. So if you make $36,000 a year or less, you would be qualified for a Habitat home from a financial point of view. Because our position is that um, you are likely to be unable to obtain a mortgage from a bank if your capability for income or your income was 60% of the local median income. And you probably could not find a home for a mortgage that you could pay the monthly payment on. So you become the people that we want to help. That also means that we can't help everybody. You know, so another distinguishing feature of affordable housing is you have to pick the population that's going to be the target for you. You know, if, if you have subsidized apartments with Section 8 vouchers, you're helping a certain type of the population. But if you are a low-income homeowner that wants to become a member of the community and pay property taxes and become a homeowner, then you are the cohort that we're looking for in Habitat. Um, and again, they buy their homes from Habitat. So we build a house, we spend X dollars in building that house, and then we have a cost structure, and we turn around and sell that home to the qualified home. And they take a 25, 30-year mortgage, and they pay us back. But there are some additional tricks to make that work. Um, As I mentioned, we're not for profit. So what makes our cost low enough that we could have this kind of mission? What are the drivers that do that? And how does that compare with the business model that a for-profit builder will use or a for-profit developer will use? Which goes back to my comment that the idea that a for-profit builder can be incentivized to build low-cost housing is inherently flawed because their business model requires that their cost structure be significantly different. They have to pay subs, they have to pay full price for materials, etc., etc. So how, how does it happen that we can pull it off? Well, for one thing, we're not for profit, so we don't have to make a profit. Uh, we don't have any salaries to pay. We don't have to make a profit. Number two, our, our labor is volunteer. If we can do it, if one of our volunteers, and we have about 50 volunteers on our list, if one of our volunteers knows how to do it, then he or she will be the person who will do that construction work. We don't have to go find a sub and pay for it. Now, there are some things we can't do because we don't know how or we don't have the skill set, and that we pay for. But basically, we use volunteer labor wherever we can. We have no government funding. Uh, we promote home ownership, not rental property. Now, this next one is a key element of the success story from the point of view of the buyer. The buyer is looking for a couple of things. A low-cost structure that is safe and attractive and where they want to live with their children. That's our responsibility to do that, to create low-cost through our labor and through our uh, 501c3 volunteer. But the, then they need a financing vehicle that will be affordable. What does that mean? That means that the mortgage payment has to be affordable. So you have a low cost to begin with, and then you have to have a mortgage that's affordable. So Habitat carries all the mortgages at 0%. So for those of you that are business people, Imagine the business model that requires that you upfront all the cost of materials. The labor is free, but the materials are not. You upfront all the cost of materials. You upfront all the cost of the land. And then you sell it to a person for your cost with no markup. And they pay you back over 25 years at 0% interest. How does that work? 
only if there are donations that come in that make up for that cash flow lag between our outflow of cash and the input or the, the return is going to take 25 years. So without donations, the thing falls apart. So donations become crucial. But more important, the model, again, going back to my concept about the reason that a developer is not the right agency to build affordable housing, is even if you could get them to build it at a low cost, which I suspect is not that easy, who finances that? The local banks at the local mortgage rate? How does that create affordable housing? The developer isn't going to give the buyer of his low-cost apartment a 0% mortgage. So if you didn't have a financing instrument to coordinate with the lower cost of the product you're selling, how would you be able to create affordable housing? Thus, some of the, some of the unknown truths inside the Habitat model. Then, again, because we are trying to create a partnership, partnership with local residents who are going to live in the community, we want to make sure that they are a responsible homeowner, which means we have to understand that they will, in fact, pay us the mortgage, that they will, in fact, take care of their property, that they will, in fact, um, have a commitment to find or keep employment. Um, so we do all the things that you would do if you were applying for a bank mortgage. We ask for a credit check, we ask for a criminal background check, we ask for employment status. There's a vetting process, and the vetting process is not designed to discriminate against people who are low-income people. On the contrary, it's designed to accommodate a low-income individual who has the interest in being a property owner. Many low-income people, many regular-income people prefer a rental property because that way somebody else takes care of it. Isn't it easier if you're renting to call the landlord when your air conditioning breaks? Or when you're... So it's not everybody who wants to be a home. So when we vet families, we often have families who say, oh, that isn't for me. I don't want the responsibility of owning my own house and taking care of my repairs and taking care of basically a piece of property that I'm buying. So we look for families that are interested in doing that. So not everybody who applies, even if they qualify, end up being people who are the right homeowner for Habitat to be able to say, yes, you can be a neighbor in any neighborhood in Fernandina where we have built a house because you have the interest in being a responsible homeowner. So, and then the other thing that's interesting is when a family moves into their home, they become property taxpayers. So no subsidized apartment, no government, um, I don't want to call it a handout, but no government assistance. You know, you, you put in 300 hours of sweat equity, you helped build your house, you have demonstrated that you can keep up with the payments, and you're now sitting on a piece of property that you have acquired for a fraction of what it would have cost on the open market, and you have a financial instrument that allows you to buy it back at 0% interest. That's the model. That's how it works. So if we look at who are these people in Fernandina, again, I've given you some examples. Entry-level police, nurses aides, teachers, clerical workers. And one of the criteria that Habitat requires is that for an applicant to be considered a, an appropriate applicant, they ha we have to, in a sense, demonstrate that they would be unable to qualify for a market rate mortgage in the community in which they live because of their income, and they would be unable to buy a home because the local market real estate is whatever. Now, I don't know if you got, you may keep track of this. What is currently today on the market the least expensive 
freestanding home that you can buy in Fernandina. Last time I looked, it was 275. On the island or off? On the island. Go ahead. So, go ahead. and it's going to go higher. But so, right now, we are in a market where you would have to be able to demonstrate financial capability in buying a piece of property that would be on the market for 275000 and a mortgage that even at today's rates would be what, 3%, 3.5%. Guess what? Not at $36,000 a year. So, anyway, so that's who we help. So, what have we been doing since 1995? Well, we have built 44 homes, all within the city limits of Fernandina. Um, we are currently building home 45 and 46 on the corner of Elm Street and 13th. And of those 44 homes, <clears throat> 29 are paying us a mortgage. Every month we get a check with the principal, the tax escrow, and the insurance escrow. And Habitat manages that just as if we were a bank. We have to compute the escrow, pay the taxes, pay the insurance, but our homeowner is paying us back. 12 homes have been fully paid for. The people have lived in them 20 years, 25 years, and they're fully paid for. Some still own them, some still live there, some have sold them. We don't keep track of that other than we know that most of the people that stayed long enough to pay their home have stayed on the island as residents. Um, three of them are rented. That happens when a person has been unable to complete their sweat equity, 300 hours, in the time period when their house, house was being built. So for a period of a year beyond that building, we allow them to rent their property from us because they cannot qualify for a Habitat mortgage until they have um, donated the 300 hours of sweat equity. So I've got three renters who are living in a home that they are going to eventually qualify for and we'll give them a mortgage and they'll start paying us back. So that's the only reason 29 and 12 don't add up to 44. Uh, you need three more, and the three more are rented property. Where are these places? Everywhere. 13th Terrace, 13th Street, 11th Street, 10th Street, 9th Street, 7th Street, 6th, 8th, Elm Street, Division. They're everywhere. Anywhere in Fernandina where you know you might have a, a 25-foot lot, which is the original planning, or a 50-foot lot, um, single-family home, it could be a habitat. Uh, so they're scattered throughout the community. We don't get government or state funding. How many people have um, been unable to keep up their payments in the last 25 years? We've had two families who were unable to keep up with their payments for reasons that are varied, right? They could have gotten sick, somebody could have died, um, they might have lost their employment, whatever. The point is that we are the bank. And if we are the bank, and you can't pay your mortgage, something has to happen. Now, we don't want the sheriff evicting you. We don't want some sort of foreclosure process that ruins your credit record, meager as it may be. So we work with our homeowners, and the two homeowners who were unable to fulfill their obligation signed a deed in the For those of you that know real estate, you understand what that means. They deed the house back to us. And but they move on to other arrangements that might meet their needs, and Habitat keeps that home for another family that might qualify. And that's, that's an instance where they would be uh, in a position to buy the house because it's built, but they haven't spent the 300 hours, so they have to rent it until they spend the 300 hours. So we've had two defaults. Um, as of our board meeting on Monday, all 29 homeowners that are paying a mortgage were up to date. Nobody was behind. We do that. We track that, obviously. I mean, think of it as a bank. If you get behind in your car payment, does the bank call you? Oh, yeah. Uh, so we know who's not behind and, and so forth. This is important. The homeowner pays taxes based on market value, not what they pay for the house. Market value. Little known fact. So I'll give you an example with some numbers. 
the last house that we finished, I won't tell you where it is because that's inappropriate for the homeowner who lives there, was had a market value <clears throat> of $230,000. Um, the mortgage, because the mortgage only reflects our, our cost, was about 130000 maybe 135, give it to me. So in most real estate transactions, the tax would be based on that 135 that that person paid for it. That isn't the way it works in Fernandina, nor should it. The, the tax is based on the market value of the house. Now, the way that we make that work is we actually issue two mortgages that add up to the full market value, but only the first mortgage has a payment schedule. So for those of you who are quick with your math, you'll understand that if your house has a market value of 300,000 and your mortgage with Habitat is 100,000, the gap is made up by a second mortgage that doesn't have any payment schedule. And that second mortgage becomes due and payable the day you sell your home if you sell it prior to the first mortgage being paid. That prevents flipping to make a profit. The first mortgage lasts 20 years. Until you pay it off, you're not free to sell your home without paying Habitat back, not just the first mortgage, but the full value of the second mortgage, which is the gap between market value and what you paid for the house. It's a pretty elegant model. I won't take any credit for it. It came from Habitat International. They suggested it, and it works, and it prevents slipping. You, know, you can't walk into a Habitat home, which you now own at a fraction of the cost that your neighbor paid for their house, and two months later, flip it and keep the profit, because then we wouldn't be fulfilling our mission. So the way that gets prevented is what I just talked about. So anyway, the point is that the taxes, though, are based on the full sum of the two mortgages, which also protects the issue of comparable properties in the neighborhood for purposes of real estate assessment. You don't want your next door comparable price to be its cost to habitat. You want the comparable price to be what the neighborhood, neighborhood would support for its cost structure. Again, that's why we do that. We do that for two reasons. We maintain the values across the neighborhood for purposes of real estate comparisons, and we maintain the, the tax base for the community for purposes of tax property tax. So interesting, which means that every time that we are able to lower our costs by using volunteer labor, we're still faced with an increasing property tax bill that the homeowner has to pay. At some point, those two curves are gonna cause us a problem because I've got to keep the monthly payment at a point that it's affordable but I don't control the tax liability or the cost of insurance. I only control the cost of the principal of the mortgage. The other two things are uncontrollable by us, but they're important to the homeowner who has to pay for them. All right, so again, how does it all come together? Well, first of all, we have to find affordable land. And Fernandina, what does that mean? <laughs> so, Okay, so we're, we've been very fortunate. We've continued to accumulate land. Again, we can use a um, the plat, a 25-foot plat, which was the original plat in Fernandina. It works for us for a small two-bedroom home. If we're going to build a three-bedroom home, we need a 50-foot plat. But so we we keep an eye out for plats that are available. Um, sometimes families donate them to us. Sometimes estates donate them to us on one um, remarkable location, the county gave one to us. Um, um, and uh, sometimes we've bought them on the open market. Sometimes the people have uh, discounted it and then made the difference um, a donation. So just to not dwell on this, we, we continue to always look for land because if we don't have affordable land, it doesn't matter that the house is can be put up 
volunteer labor. I got to have a piece of land to put it on. And when I develop a mortgage and a market value, the land is part of it. So, so that's important. The fact that we're not for profit, we can get grants, we can ask for discounts at stores and discounts for construction material. We don't always get the discount, but Hardy Board, for those of you that know construction, those are the lap deciding that all the houses have around here, usually they're Hardy Board, which is a cement based uh, construction material. The Hardy Company in Georgia has donated all the Hardy Board that we've used for the last three houses. Right. So, which I think is I think is terrific. Yeah. It's not cheap stuff. So we we can get we get donations, we get discounts, you know, uh, Lowe's, RPM Lumber, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We get grants, you know, we get money from churches, we get money from one of our big donors is public supermarkets. Uh, we get uh, the banks donate money, the corporate banks, you know, Wells Fargo donates money. Um, the churches donate money. Individuals, lots of individuals donate money. Um, so we get grants, we get donations, and we get discounts. Volunteer labor. We, our selection criteria is based on the local meat and income, and there's we cannot exceed a certain amount. So we don't have the flexibility that says, well, you know, we thought we could do this. We committed to the city that we would put together an affordable housing apartment within our building, but it turned out to be more expensive and and now the person can't afford it. Well, too bad. Well, we don't have that flexibility. We need to do, develop a process that says that when I have a house that I can sell to you, I'm going to be able to meet your in, income requirements to keep it affordable. And we do that by watching our volunteer labor costs, our materials costs, and making sure that when it's all said and done, the package and the financial instrument that we use to finance it fits within your income requirements. We're dispersed locations. It's harder to find big plats of undeveloped land than it is to find individual lots here and there, number one. And number two, I think there is a wonderful synergy to the idea that your neighbor could be a Habitat homeowner as opposed to Oh, that's the Habitat neighborhood over there. I'm not saying it's a bad model. I'm saying it's a model that in a community of this size, we don't think that's the right model for us. In the city of Jacksonville, that model works. The city of Jacksonville allocates huge neighborhoods to Habitats. And they, they develop streets, and they put in sewer, and they put in water, and then they turn over the area to Habitat to create Habitat homes in a large area that's circumscribed by the fact that the city donated that piece of property to them. That's great. I think, I personally believe that our model here, where we have dispersed homeowners, is more relevant to the way our community sees itself. But, so be that as it may, we have dispersed locations, we vet our homeowners, we involve them for the reasons we've already talked about, and they pay property taxes based on market value. So go back to our early discussion when we first started and think about if these are the things that we believe you have to have to have a successful affordable housing model and a successful affordable housing effort. What types of organizations would be in a position to, to do something like this? Not very many. There, I, Habitat is not the only one. There are other not-for-profit organizations that build housing for low-income families. They build housing for veterans. They build housing for um, disabled people. <clears throat> but my point is, it's not some for-profit developer, generally. It's not subsidized apartments from the government. It's not the traditional things that people think about when they think about affordable housing. This model, I think, has a lot of power, but it has a lot of elements that have to be present for it to be successful. It doesn't, it doesn't grow on trees. 
it's got to be planned for and it's got to be maintained it's got to be nurtured because as i said earlier look at the business model you've got all this upfront cost and the recovery takes 25 years and you don't get back even the cost of money because you're selling it you're at zero interest so it only works if the donations that come in make up that gap in cash flow. And I believe sincerely that for this to work, you need to create organizations, not-for-profit organizations, dedicated to the concept of creating affordable housing. And if our community had a different um, priority system, for example, and if Habitat maybe wasn't here or whatever, and they needed to create affordable housing, they'd have to think in terms of creating a not-for-profit organization organized around the concept of volunteer labor to create low-cost housing and organized around the concept of not-for-profit and, and all the other things we've just spent the last 40 minutes discussing. And I, and I don't know that any, any city commissioner here or in Jacksonville or any of the cities that have affordable housing programs look at it this way. They look at it more like basically subsidized rental property. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a model that works for a certain population. This model is much more powerful. It also is hard to scale up because of all the pieces that it requires. Now, it can be scaled up, but it's hard. The city of Jacksonville, I believe, last time I looked at it, builds Habitat, Habitat, builds about 150 houses each year. Yeah. Following this model, we build two. <laughs> However, Habitat has a staff, an executive staff, yeah. which is fine. You know, they have donations from the city. The city, in a sense, is a promoter of Habitat and creates the infrastructure with which an organization like Habitat has the capability of building 150 houses a year because the city of Jacksonville has the scale to do that. We could scale up a little bit. We could go to three houses a year, maybe. But the point is that scaling this model is hard. And if you live in a small community, you don't need to scale it. But if you live in a big community and you want this model to work, you need to have a lot of pieces come together. Um, anyway, so that's where we are here. And just to give you a sense of, um, this is two homes that I drove around uh, a few weeks ago to photograph them. Um, I won't tell you where they are, uh, but they're somewhere in the community. This is a three bedroom home um, and uh, this is a two bedroom home. And uh, the architecture design for these homes was done by Miranda Architects, a local architectural firm. And the um, architectural design for the homes we're building now, which are slightly different, was done by John Kotner, um, again, a local architect. Just to give you a sense of scale, a three bedroom home is about 1,150 11, 11 square feet. A two-bedroom home is about 850 square feet. A uh, two-bedroom home has one bath. Three-bedroom home has two baths. Um, and our cost, our habitat cost, without land, is running at about $110 a square foot, give or take. So if I'm building an 850 square foot two-bedroom home, my out-of-pocket cost is going to be about 93000 at $110 a square foot. The market value of that home will be around 250 And we've talked about how we manage that differential. Um, so that's the story, and that's kind of how it all comes together. And hopefully some of this information was new, and you found it interesting. And uh, I'll be glad to take questions. What happens if um, one of your homeowners um, needs to relocate well, for whatever reason. The require, the, there is a requirement in the mortgage that we be given the right of first refusal to buy the house back. They, um, under the mortgage requirements, if we buy it back, 
we are obligated to pay them back their equity, but not their profit. Not any. In other words, what drives the payment is what they've paid in, not the market value of the house. If they choose to sell it on the open market, which they can do, they'll have to repay that second mortgage in one lump sum. Which means that basically we don't prevent them from selling it. We are asked to have right of first refusal. We allow them to sell it, but they have to pay back the market differential so that the profit is usually not very attractive. Has that happened at all in this recent economy where house prices are going berserk? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. How did you deal with the situation where the um, the entry level radiologist gets a real good bump up in salary and gets out of your income range? Right? Well, you know we've puzzled over that. And the only thing I can say, which is kind of a flippant way to answer the question, is that when you bought, when you maybe uh, took your first mortgage on your house um, and the bank gave you a 20 year mortgage and the next year you got a big bump in salary, did the bank change your payment? Uh, no. no. So if our homeowner is lucky enough to get a big bump in salary, you know, there's a 20 year legal obligation to that payment. And I can't just change it because you make more money. Yeah. But it does create an imbalance, right? Um, we haven't had a lot of that, although there's rumors in the community of homeowners that so and so just got a big promotion. And all I can say is, God bless you. I mean, I think it's great. But I can't change your payment, nor should I. Yeah. Uh, but th that is a question that comes up, and I don't know that there's a good answer other than we have a legal instrument of financing that I'm not allowed to change just because your personal situation improved. Do you often have um, two um, salaries, or is it mostly a single mother? Or a it's single mostly mother? single salary, but we do have several homeowners where it's both salaries. Yes. Yes, sir. When you... There were two, I think you said you took back. Yeah, Peter Lou. And you're, you look for new people to rent that. They take over the rental, do they get a 20 year lease the same? Well, they, they, they first rent for a year. During that year, okay. they have to make up their 300, 300 hours of sweat equity. Right. And then they get a 20 year mortgage. So it's a new 20 year mortgage yes. out of the age of the house. Yes. Now, do you ever consider selling that on the open market? And, and then using recover cash, the cash there yeah. to buy your lots or stuff. Yeah. Like we've that. we've talked about it. We haven't done it because we have this idea that once we have a house in the inventory of affordable housing, it's a precious commodity. I mean, in this city, to have a home that is safe and well built and can be afforded by a person with low income is a precious commodity. And to sell it just to recover the cost. We would only do it if we were short of cash. I mean, if we were short of cash, we we have to look for cash. There's other mechanisms. We have a credit line at the bank, and we've got some other things. But clearly, we could. We could take a mortgage and recover it, especially in situations where the homeowner has left for whatever reason. And all your houses so far have been single family homes. Yes. You ever considered duplexes? We just are building our first duplex. One of the habitat requirements, though, is that each residence within the duplex has to be individually titled, deeded, and mortgaged. So what that means is that everything about that half of that structure legally is, is a piece of personal property, including the boundary lines and the lot. We can't have an association. We can't have a common space that would impact the mortgage of that homeowner. So we have to do a lot of work with the city to make that happen. But we do, we're building them now, and we have two single family, two bedroom homes in the same structure, each of them with their own deed, their own mortgage, their own title, and their own property boundaries. Vertically? One is vertical and one is horizontal, but they're, but they're attached. But they're attached. Because that's a prettier profile. 
and John Kottner was very interested in the aesthetics. I assume Kottner and Miranda, they give the, the drawings they, to you? Or they do. Yeah. They donate their professional time. Another example of a community right. really coming in, <coughs> uh, Asa Gillette donated all the engineering time. That's a lot of professional time. Al? Yes, ma'am. Um, you said that you had to actually start from scratch. So what brought you, after having had a life before coming here, you and the other group, what made you think about this? How did you come to, oh, we're going to go to Fernandina to... Well, this isn't my design. This no, is a I design that I took over when I got here. But I mean, but still, the group who got it together, I mean, that... They, they had to start from scratch. They had to start from scratch. And they did. And I, of course, that was back in 1995, uh -huh. and when they started from scratch, created, created the, the corporation, created the event, worked with Habitat to create the bylaws, so I basically took over a running enterprise. However, keeping it running yeah. is, uh, you know, kind Challenging. of like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But I did. I mean, I took over a running enterprise. When I took over, we were at probably I think like 30 houses already, and we had a board of six people, and we had uh, donors that had been donating for many years. But all of that requires tender loving care or a false part. <laughs> yeah. Question. You you had mentioned something about uh, a homeowner passing away or something like that. So if you have a single family, um, single income, maybe it's a father or a mother with a child <coughs> and the parent dies. Uh, let's say the child is getting ready to graduate from high school and go on. Does that home, can that low-income home be passed on? It becomes an estate question. It is, okay. So it becomes a legal question that the state of Florida probably knows how to handle. In terms of do they have a will? Oh, geez. Do we need to do probate? Uh, is it part of their estate? Did they will it to their relative? Yeah. So we would have to comply with whatever legal <coughs> issues there are. But to the degree that the house becomes available for sale as a result of a death, yeah. we have priority in buying it, okay. and we would be given right of first refusal, and or we could ap approach the heirs and negotiate with them. Okay. But there would the only automatic transition to another person would be as a result of a of a will that had been recorded and was a valid will yeah. where the person could pass the property on to an heir yeah. without habitat being involved. Because like any mortgage holder, you know, we, we have to protect the asset which is the collateral. Right. So but the state, the rules about estates and properties and wills certainly supersede, you know, our interest in that property because we would be no more than just another interest against an estate asset. Okay, so is there that sort of counseling to the low-income family mm -hmm. to consider? I mean, yeah, there, there, there hasn't been. We've done, we do financial counseling on okay. setting up a budget and setting up payments. We have not gotten into counseling for basically transition of your assets. We yeah. just haven't gotten into that. But we ha we do uh, we do require, I believe it's ten hours of financial counseling with one of our board members who's a banker, yeah. and they help them set up a budget. They help them um, talk about what percent of their income is going to housing, what percent is going to other things. And that's part of your pre-work before you would be allowed to apply for a mortgage. So, and that's one thing that I have not mentioned and I should have, going back to vetting applicants and going back to the kinds of things we do that we believe contribute to our success is we require that these homeowners go through a, about a 20 hour financial counseling process that we run because one of our board members works for the local a local bank. That's that's a good idea. And she takes that on as one yeah. of one of, one of her duties. So okay. thank you. Other questions or I think we've got five minutes maybe but no more than that. 
The question of um, racial equity is top of mind these days mm -hmm. in so many institutions. How does the um, distribution of racial ownership amongst the homes compare with that of the community at large? It's quite close, which basically means that there are very few minorities because the community at large has few minorities. But we do have several minority homeowners and um, and we basically rely on the application process to drive that. We've been advertising in the local newspaper that we're taking applications for housing. Um, we've spoken to um, the uh, individual who runs the program at the school for families, families in transition, which is a program for students and parents who are not, who don't have permanent housing. Many of them are immigrants. Uh, and or new to the community. And we have outreach to minority churches through um, the current population of homeowners who go to local churches that have a minority population. But at the end of the day, the cohort in this island doesn't have a lot of people in those categories. Mm -hmm. But we would certainly, our homeownership currently reflects that imbalance, but it's not exacerbated by anything we're doing. Okay. Well, what is your greatest need in terms of support, not by the community at the grassroots level, but municipally or at, uh, at a city, county level? I think just facilit facilitating the process whenever, whenever there is an opportunity to um, expedite something. But we don't need, we don't want, nor we, nor should we get special treatment. In, in inspections or in any sort of zoning problem. We comply with all the zoning regulations. We comply with all the building inspections, as we should. We comply with all the other requirements. But to the degree that, you know, if it's a matter of expediting a process to facilitate something, it would be great. And if the community has extra uh, property that they have that is basically, the, all communities have extra property that they don't have any need for we would look for the community to consider a donation to us of an extra piece of land that is sitting in their inventory that they don't need. <coughs> I'm thinking that the city probably has somewhere in its code that it will support affordable housing or will encourage it. It's a, what, it what sort of practical, what, pra what would that mean up, up to now, practically, there hasn't been an instance where that has occurred. In, in other words, there hasn't been any evidence that they're doing something for us that overtly puts us in a different category than any other. Okay. Yes, Thank you. In the, you know, besides salary to qualify, are there any other criteria? Must you be married? Must you have children? No. The only other criteria is you cannot qualify for a home mortgage, for a, a market rate mortgage. So your asset base has <coughs> to be true. such that's it. So a single person. Yeah. Because you're going to say, yeah. Yeah. A single this person. price I can afford by a house. A single person could apply for a two bedroom home. We do look at children to determine whether it's two or three bedrooms. Do they have two children, one child? Are they same sex children? What ages are they? Are they sharing a bedroom? Is your emphasis to towards families versus? Individuals? No, but more families apply than individuals. Yes, yes. But our emphasis is not. It's totally neutral. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You haven't talked about recruiting volunteers exactly. Um, uh, and I'm not curious. I've lived in communities before where they've had somewhat similar habitat philosophies sure. to yours, I think. But um, when houses were going up, and maybe I just knew some of the structure of the community, they put out the word yeah. to get a lot of people. So a lot of um, just anybody's showed sure. up like me that could maybe paint the house, but that, you know, paint the room, yeah. but I have no, I have no uh, skill sets, especially. What, is, what are your criteria and how do you work? We, uh, we've been advertising in the newsletter. Uh, I see, I see a, a little note from Habitat very often saying volunteers encouraged to come current construction is at this in this place. And basically, we have no criteria in terms of bringing a skill set with you, other than when you come, you know, you'll need to wear a hard hat, which we can provide. 
you'll need to wear safety goggles, which we will provide, and you need to sign a, sign a liability release. Uh, but we put ads in the paper in terms of volunteer recruitment. We haven't done any more than that, but that's something that we can begin to look at. So I think we're probably out of time. Is that true? Mm -hmm. no. okay. That was mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. That was great. And thank you all for coming and we hope to see you on May first at the reopening. Yeah. That was terrific. Now I know what you